what I uh, want to do today um, is sort of reinforce um, the whole concept of how selection works and, and uh, try to get you into a mode of thinking about natural selection and, and um, why things are the way they are. Uh, and the way we're going to do that, um, uh, rather than start talking about uh, diversity and, and those sorts of things, um, so I want to start talking about um, natural history a little bit. Um, and uh, we'll, this door, uh, we'll use a couple of different uh, organisms as examples, but we'll also be talking quite a bit about humans because that's the, uh, the organism that we know best. Um, and the first point that I want to make, and this is critical, um, is that um, the goal of all life history strategies, and, and life is a game, right? It's a strategy just like any sort of computer game that you might play, or chess, or um, whatever it happens to be, there's a strategy. Um, and in the game of life, if that's what you want to call it, uh, the ultimate strategy is what? What's, what's the purpose of life? What, what are the two most important things in life? The, that question will be on, on your first um, little exam, which is coming up here pretty quickly. What's the, what are the two most important things in life? Food and reproduction. Yeah, food and reproduction. Okay? So the goal of all life history strategies is to maximize Um, inclusive fitness. So it's to maximize inclusive fitness. What do I mean by inclusive fitness? Well, what I, what I mean is the number of copies of your alleles that you're able to get into the next generation. Okay? Um, and there are a couple of ways to do that, right? One is to live longer, right, and have more reproductive opportunities. Um, another one is to reproduce more often yourself. Of course, there are other ways to do it as well. You might decide you don't want to have any kids of your own. You can still maximize your inclusive fitness by promoting reproduction in your siblings or your cousins or whoever else, right? The idea is to get as many copies of your alleles into succeeding generations as you possibly can. Okay? You can either do that personally, or you can do that through your siblings, or your cousins, or your nephews, or whatever. Okay? How many copies of your alleles do you manage to get out there? The, the uh, organism that gets the greatest number of copies of their alleles out there, that's the organism that wins. Okay, it's that simple. That doesn't mean you have to play the game. Don't want to play the game? Don't. That's fine, right? This isn't a requirement. But the fact that you're here today, right, is because somebody, unwittingly or not, played the game, okay, and got their copies of their alleles into the next generation, and lo and behold, there you are. Okay. So it's not just how many offspring you produce, right? It's how many copies of your alleles are you getting out there? Okay, well, let's think about how, um, how we go about doing that. Obviously, uh, what's the connection to food and sex? Well, you don't, you don't get copies of your alleles out there unless you reproduce or your siblings reproduce or you devote resources to your siblings or whatever and you can't do any of that unless you're consuming food right so when we try to understand whether it's plants or animals right the key if you want to understand the organism is how does it manage reproduction how does it manage feeding okay all right so uh, let's think a little bit then um, about humans. Um, what are the, if we want to understand uh, inclusive fitness in humans, and we're going to look at 
the ways humans reproduce, um, what are the possible mating systems that we employ? What's, what's the most common mating system here in the good old USA? Yeah, you guys never think about that sort of stuff. Well, usually um, it's one male and one female. Okay? Uh, what's that called? No, 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 you're thinking along. I mean, yeah, ultimately, ultimately, right. The reason for those two people being together is to reproduce, right? Uh, but when you have a system in which it's one male, one female, what do we call that? Heterosexual. Well, yeah, um, yeah. So, oh, so an important point. Uh, let's let's make sure we understand the difference between sex and gender. Okay, uh, when I go and catch a squirrel or a, a raccoon or a coyote or something, uh, and I flip it over, I don't care about its gender. I care about its sex. Is this thing male or is it female? Okay, that's all. The notion of gender is a human thing. We have genders. Plants and animals have sexes. We have sexes too, right? We have males and females. But, right, because of all sorts of interesting phenomena that take place psychologically and developmentally and genetically, uh, we have all of these different sort of things going on as well. So you can have, uh, you can have homosexual males, you can have homosexual females, you can have bisexual males, bisexual females, you can have transgender, you can have asexual, you can have anything in between, right? It's this pretty broad spectrum, and it's there for a reason. It's not necessarily there because of a choice. Oh, I think I'll go through life being transgender. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, it seems to me that would be pretty darn difficult to do and not very satisfying. Okay, That's a whole different ball of wax. What I care about is simply the sex. And, and by sex, in this case, I don't mean the act of sexual reproduction. What I mean is, is the organism male or female? Okay? So let's go back. It's 1952 all over again. Okay? Let's go back and think about what the mating systems are that are available. What do we do? What's the most common mating system in the US of A? Well, one man, one woman, right? Or no? You don't think so? You have no opinion? You don't want to go out on a limb? You're worried that I'll have weird thoughts about you? I'll think you're uh, odd or something like that? No? Okay. It's called, starts with an M. Monogamy? Yeah. Monogamy. Mono means one. Right? Mono, one. Gamete, as in gametes. So one set of gametes. Okay? So that's monogamy. Uh, are there any examples of animals that are truly monogamous? Aren't swans? Yes, there are some swans that are absolutely strictly monogamous, okay? A male and a female will form a pair bond, and that pair bond is there forever. And if one of the animals dies, the other one will never form another pair bond, okay? So they mate for life, and they're serious about it. Is that what we as humans do? Nah. The old lady dies give it a couple of weeks, and then start dating again, okay? How many of you come from a relationship, your parents have always been together, never had another partner? So 
they married their high school or junior high school sweetheart. Now it's one person, okay? It's not very common. Most of, how many of you today are dating your first and only ever partner? You've dated multiple people, right? In other words, you're already practicing not strict monogamy, but serial monogamy. So you have one partner at a time, right? And it's not that one partner for life. You go through a series of parts. Yeah, no, not him. No, no, not her. No, not nah, nice, but not quite. You, know? you go through life looking for that perfect match. And then you find it, and then you marry that person, and then after a while say, no, not that one, you get a divorce, and then you start all over again, okay? That's typically the way we do it, okay? So what we practice as humans, for the most part, is serial monogamy. Hmm. Is that true? Are there any other sort of mating systems practiced anywhere else? Well, what do they do in Utah and uh, southern Idaho and northern Nevada? What mating system is common there? Polygamy. Yeah, polygamy. Okay. And actually, it's it's uh, it's a special kind of polygamy. Um, it's called polygyny. So it's many females. So it's one male and many females. And we need to put the female above, or the male above the females because he's dominant, right? He controls all of the females. Polygamy means many sets of gametes instead of just one set of gametes. So you could have polygyny, or you could have polyandry. Which is one female and many males. And here we'll put the female above the males because she's dominant. Okay? And then, of course, there's another one out there as well. And that would be promiscuity. I'm going to put that over here. And promiscuity is, for example, you have a male, and the male is just spreading his gametes all over the place without any sort of choice or regard or whatever. Okay. And or the female could do the same thing. Okay, although it's fundamentally different for a female than it is for a male. Okay. Now, which system is best? Why is it that in the U.S. we have monogamy? Let's think about that. What was the common mating system at the time of Jesus? Polygyny. Okay? It was a polygynous system. What do you see in the Middle East today? I mean, the, where does Christianity begin in the Middle East? What is the most common mating system today that you find in the Middle East? Polygyny. The Amir of Kuwait has, I don't know how many kids, how many wives? Osama bin Laden had how many wives? He had something like 50 wives or something like that. They, three of them were in the compound when they came to kill him. Okay? So, wives all over the place. Which system is best? Well, what do we mean by best? What, what criteria do we use to decide which one is best? The amount of reproduction that takes place? Yeah, 
Yeah, so so the one that maximizes the inclusive fitness. Okay? So we need to think about two things. We need to think about the inclusive fitness of the male, and we need to think about the inclusive fitness of the female. So let's think about that for just a minute. Let's compare males versus females. So what determines the inclusive fitness of a male? So I could walk up, I'm not going to do that, but I could walk up to any male in this classroom and say, so hey, uh, how many kids you got out there? Okay? And what's the only true response? It's either none or I don't know. Why? If he knows that he's never copulated, okay, he knows that he has no offspring. But if he's copulated, how does he know how many offspring he's produced? He doesn't. Okay? Lots of one night stands out there where, you know, you never saw her again and who knows what happens nine months later, okay? How about the female? The female is going to be pretty darn sure whether she's given birth or not. She will know. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that just happened, okay? It, you're going to be aware of it. It's not going to just sort of sneak by you. So that's an important distinction. The female knows, right? The male doesn't. The female knows what her immediate inclusive fitness is. The male doesn't. So let's think about dating, OK? Um, in general, who asks who out for a date? I, I know that you know things have changed since the 50s, but in general, it's, the general rule still holds. Who's asking who out for a date? The male. The male is generally the one that asks for the date. Okay, so it's the male that's pursuing the female in general. All right, why is that? Why does the male pursue the female rather than the other way around? I'm, I'm not saying that women haven't, you know, put themselves in a position or tried to promote a relationship or, you know, or even asked a male out or something. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but in general, it, it's certainly less common than the male being the one that's trying to establish the relationship. Why is that? Well, let's think about what reproduction means for the male and the female. So what is the male's contribution to any kind of reproductive event? What does the male contribute? Yeah, I've never been out on a date before, is that it? What do you do? You ask her out, you take her out, take her out for a happy meal and a movie, okay? So, you spend a couple of bucks, okay? You don't want to do, spend too much because, I mean, just because, who knows where this thing's going. So you spend just a couple of bucks, you take her out on a date, maybe things go the way you had hoped they would, and then you contribute little lucky Pierre there, this little tiny itsy bitsy sperm. That's the way, bam, thank you, ma'am. You're gone. You never see her again. Okay? That's your contribution. What's the female's contribution? The female contributes this gigantic egg. Okay? The egg gets fertilized. 
for the next nine months, she's pregnant, and this developing fetus is just robbing her body of calcium, right? And as long as she's got this fetus developing inside of her, she's not going to reproduce with anyone else. So those nine months are locked up. Then for the next 18 years, she's responsible for this, this monstrosity that she's just produced. Okay. And there it is. So she spent 18 years, nine months, and just all this effort and all this energy and all this wear and tear on her body. And the guy, Happy Meal in a movie, and that thing. That's his contribution. Okay? It gets worse. How many kids could a guy have in a lifetime? How many? Ballpark. All right, well, let's, let's figure it out. So you're going to start when you're 16, okay? And starting when you're 16, every day you chat up a bunch of ladies. And every day you manage to sleep with one lady, okay? Of all the ladies that you sleep with, roughly 25% are going to be ovulating. Okay? So that means every four days, every four days, you've impregnated another female. Well, let's say there are 400 days in a year, all right, on Sunday you do it twice or something, I don't know. That means potentially you could have 100 kids per year. So we're going to go from 16 to 96. On your 96th birthday, you have a stroke or a heart attack or, I don't know, your testicles fall off. Something happens, something horrible happens, and you're gone, okay? So that means over a period of 80 years, that means you produce 8,000 offspring, okay? Each offspring has half of your allele. So that means there are now 4,000 copies of your alleles out there in the next generation. Okay? Pretty good. Now, let's think about the female. If, you, if, if all you want to do is just play this game and maximize your inclusivity, you don't care about anything else, all you want to do is start popping out babies and win the game of evolution. How many babies could you make? Well, what's the world record? What's the greatest number of kids you've ever heard of produced by a female? Anybody have any clue? When I was a kid, in the neighborhood where I lived, there were a lot of Catholics. And right or wrong, we all thought, you know, the Catholics, all they do is make babies. Okay, that was what my parents said anyway. My, my parents were odd. Um, but there, there was this Catholic family across the street, and they had six kids. And I knew of a Catholic family that had eight kids or something like that. So, I mean, there were lots of kids. But what's, what's the record? The record is 65. So a female produced 65 kids in her life. And this was in the post-dispatch probably about 10, 15 years ago. And the reason it made the post-dispatch, the reason it was in the paper was because she had her 65th kid at the age of 65. Okay? 
you're going, well, wait a minute, menopause, you know, I mean, she probably should have been shutting down by the time she was 45, 50 or something like that. Yeah, typically that's the way it works, but in this female, who knows why, whether it's because of the constant, you know, reproductive stuff that she was going through, that her ovaries just kept working, right? Who knows what, but on her 65th, in her 65th year, she had her 65th kid. Lots of twins, lots of triplets, lots of different husbands. Okay? But 65 kids. You, none of you are going to make that milestone, and that's not bad. Okay? But half of those are hers. Okay, let's just say she made 60. That would mean she had 30 copies of her alleles out there. 4,000 compared to 30. Who has the reproductive advantage? You don't know? Who has the reproductive advantage here? Males or females? Males. It would appear that the males have the reproductive advantage. Okay? Now, this guy that produced these 4,000 kids, his investment was pretty minuscule. If your investment in something is exceedingly small, how much do you care about it? If you get something for free and you lose it, eh, whatever. If you get something you paid a buck for, it gets broken right away, uh, I'll go get another one. No big deal. If it's really expensive, if you just went out and spent, you know, $80,000 on a brand new convertible Corvette or something, and it gets scratched, you're going to go ballistic. Okay? You just, you just spent all this money on this nice new dress or these nice new shoes and the first time you wear them they get ruined. They're going to be upset. Okay? In other words, if something is cheap, yeah, whatever. If something is expensive, it's a big deal. Think about that. Who loves you more, your mom or your dad? Oh, that's a loaded question, isn't it? Who loves you more? I know you're not going to just come on. Well, well, obviously my mom or obviously my dad, you would never say that because you're worried about God striking you down dead with a bolt of lightning or something like that, okay? Or you wouldn't want the word to get out of your dad to hear that you said, Mommy loves you more, okay? But if you really stop to think about it, right, who's more concerned about you, Mom or Dad? You say, I, how the fuck should I know? And I'm adopted, or I'm an orphan, or who knows? Okay. Well, what's the male's contribution? Minuscule. Let, let's look at it this way. Who's more likely to commit child abuse? When child abuse happens, which, who's most likely to commit child abuse? The father is more likely than the mother. And a stepfather is far more likely than their actual father. Why? And, and this isn't just, you know, a slight, a slight statistical, you know, increase one over the other. The difference is remarkable. Stepfathers are hugely more likely to commit child abuse right? Whether it's sexual abuse or physical abuse or verbal abuse or whatever, then is the actual father, then is the mother. 
why. Why is that? Because I didn't expend any energy to make that offspring. Because the value of the offspring to the male, to the father, is less than the value to the female. The female has limited reproductive opportunities in her life. The male can go on reproducing throughout life. Ah, lost this one. I'll make another one. Okay? I'm not saying your dad doesn't love you. I'm not saying that. Okay? I hope that he does. I'm sure that he does, right? I'm sure he cares about you deeply and all of that sort of stuff. But if you look across the entire population, dad is more likely to be abusive than his mom, and stepdad is far more likely to be abusive. And the, the reason is, is because mom knows that you are hers, and she's invested an enormous amount in you. You are extremely valuable to her. You're less valuable to dad. Okay? He's invested a lot less in you, and he can replace you. If your mom is menopausal or postmenopausal, she's done. You're all she's got. Okay? So clearly males are evil. No, it's just that the male has a different strategy. Because now look at it from a slightly different perspective. You know who mom is, right? Do you know who dad is? So I have a brother. Um, I had two brothers, and uh, my older brother is still alive. Um, and when I was in high school, you know, we did this blood typing stuff. I figured out my, and this was something they did to every kid in high school, and they had to take this biology class, and everybody had one of the things you did was figure out your blood type. So figure out my blood type. And, Asked my mom what her blood type is, and asked my dad what his blood type is, and asked my older brother what his blood type is, and I'm going, what, wait, what? <laughs> because he obviously had a different father than I did, okay? And he never figured it out. He still doesn't, hasn't figured it out. And of course, because of the weird family dynamic and everything, I did, years later, I did my homework and I traced all this stuff down and I figured out all these things. And, and he still doesn't realize that he's a bastard son. <laughs> so who's your daddy? And if you ask him, he'll say, yeah, well, there was this guy. I said, no, sorry, man. Isn't that perfect? It's hilarious. The point is, you don't know exactly who your dad is for sure. Okay? You simply don't know. So whereas the female knows exactly who her offspring are, the male doesn't. That's one of the prices you pay for being a male, is you can't be certain. The female is certain, the male is not. All right, so now, let's go back. And ask the question, which mating system is best? There's monogamy. There's uh, polyandry. And here's polygyny. And, and remember, I'm, I'm not pointing, the, I'm not saying this is how you must live your life. 
right? Uh, you can have whatever relationship you'd like in your life, you know, I don't care. I, I don't care what my daughter does, I don't care what my son does in terms of their reproductive lifestyle, so whatever. they can do whatever they'd like, okay, as long as they're happy. That's, as a dad, that's all I care about, right? So, and, and I would, the same thing in my view holds for you. Don't feel, oh yeah, it's got to be one of these two. Do what brings you joy, do what brings you happiness, what brings you fulfillment, or whatever. But from an evolutionary point of view, which of these three is best? Which is best for the male? This one is best for the male. Why is it best for the male? Because he now, if these are the only females that he mates with, and if every female can produce right, an offspring once a year, that means he can produce five offspring per year. Okay? How many offspring per year can this guy produce? At best, one. How many offspring per year can this guy produce? On average, 0.2. So you go from 0.2 to 1 to 5. So in terms of getting copies of your alleles out there, right, here you've gotten two and a half copies of your alleles, here you've gotten one half copy of your alleles, and here you've got 0.1 copies of your alleles out there. So from an, in an evolutionary sense, which one is best for the male? This one right here. Okay? All right. Now let's turn it around. Which of these systems is best for the female? This one? How many people think this one is best for the female? They're all the same. They're all the same? Yeah, let's, let's, let's figure that out. Are they all the same from the perspective of the female? Let's think about it. Who is this male? Who is this male? And who is this male? Who are those guys? How do they differ? How many guys would say, oh yeah, oh yeah, this is, this is what I want. I want to live in a house with six people, five guys, and one woman. Oh, it'll be awesome. Who would want to do that? What would that be like? Versus just me and my honey. Versus this one. What are these guys, how do these guys differ? Okay, let's think about, I, I think we already had this discussion when we were talking about sexual selection, right? We talked about the difference between what males are looking for in a partner, what males pay attention to, and what females pay attention to. And when we had that discussion, we made the point, I think we did this, we made the point that males are paying attention primarily to physical attributes. Okay. Females, on the other hand, are paying attention to attributes that denote security, generosity, stability, right, emotional security, those sorts of things. So they're paying more attention to emotional sorts of things, right, and things that matter in terms of long-term security than are the males. All the males care about is the physical stuff, at least initially, okay? All right, so how do these males differ? Hmm. 
Okay, well, <clears throat> who is this guy right there? Give me an example of who that might be. The Emir of Kuwait. Before you were born, when H.W. Uh, Bush was president, uh, we went over there and kicked Saddam Hussein's ass and kicked him out of Kuwait so that we could save the kingdom of Kuwait from the invading Iraqi hordes. Um, and so that we could give the Emir of Kuwait to sell a gold toilet seat back, okay? So the Air, Emir of Kuwait, right, uh, gets solid gold toilets, solid gold toilet seats, right? Everything in his, in his palace is solid gold. And of course, he had a huge harem, not with five women, but I, I don't know how many women he had in his harem. It was, you know, 100 plus women in his harem or something like that. So just this huge harem. He's probably fat, he's probably short, he probably stinks, but he's got solid gold toilet seats, and he's filthy rich, okay? Who's this guy? This guy is your dad, okay? Who's that guy? Or, who's that woman? The queen. Pardon? The queen. You think? I think she's a dancer over at the Pink Pony, and I think those are all of her jobs. Okay. Who are these guys? Losers. These are the guys going to the Pink Pony, because that's as close as they're going to get to the female form, okay? These guys are the bottom of the barrel. These guys are such losers, it takes five of them to support this one female. No way these guys could get money together and buy a house. They're scraping together their money and buying a used single wide, okay? These guys are the bottom of the barrel. Okay? They're so poor, they're so broke, they're such losers, it takes five, six, seven, ten of them to support this one female. Okay? This guy's doing pretty good, man. Got a decent job, nice house, mows the lawn every week, you know, nice car, all that good stuff, steady work. This guy's filthy rich. Now, with that in mind, which system is best for the female? Also the right side. This one. This side is best for the male. That side is best for the female. Okay. Why? That's the highest quality male. He's the one who has the brains. He's the one who has the resources, whatever it is. He's got all the resources. He's the one with the palace. He's the one with the solid gold toilet seats, okay? He's, he's the guy with all the money. He's the guy with all the power, right? The kids that he produces here are going to be little princes and princesses, and they're going to be born into a life of security and whatnot, and just everything's going to be nice for them. These kids, they're going to be on welfare, going to be involved in the WIC program, they're going to be probably dropping out of school in the fourth grade or something like that. They're going to be on the street corner in Compton selling crack, okay? These kids are going to be stealing hubcaps or wheels or, you know, whatever, dealing drugs. These kids are the losers. They're going to spend most of their lives in prison, and that's the end of it. Okay? Well, if this is the best mating system for males, and it's the best mating system for females, why, except in Utah, southern Idaho, and northern Nevada, do we insist 
on that mating system in the US. Why is that? If you listen to the evangelicals, you know, the ones that get all bent out of shape about everything, and yet vote for Trump, okay? If you look at those people, marriage is one man and one woman. Well, fine, okay. Wasn't always like that, okay? But that is the way it's supposed to be now, and they feel pretty strongly about that. Why is that? Why do we do that? Does it make any sense? What do you think determines that? It never crossed your mind? You never, you never said, boy, you know, why is it that I have to choose one? Why can't I have two or something like that? Or, you know, you, why do I even have to think about it at all? Why can't I just do it? I, you know, all those sorts of things, I'm sure you, you've thought about it at some point. It is curious that in this country we mandate and enforce this, except we turn a blind eye towards Utah and southern Idaho and northern Nevada. But occasionally we don't, right? That Jeffries fellow in Arizona, he got busted. But why did they, why did they bust him? There was this polygynous sect in, in northern Arizona, uh, this Jim Jeffries guy. Um, and I think that was the basis for that television program called Sister Wives or something like that. So he had lots and lots and lots of wives, you know, and these women are going are fine with it, they're all going along with it, right? Which illustrates that they're they understand at some level what this is all about, right? Why did they arrest him? Why did he get busted? I mean, legally, you cannot marry more than one person at a time, right? That's the law. Even in Utah, even in Idaho, even in Nevada, but the government sort of turns a blind eye and ignores it, okay? Which tells you something, okay? But why did this guy get busted? He got busted because one of his, one of his wives was only 12 years old when he married her. That's why he got busted. And you can't give consent until you're 18. Okay? So, if you were 16 and you had sex for the first time, I don't even care if you consented to it or not. It's still rape. Period. End of story. Okay? Because you don't, at that age, legally have the ability to give consent. Okay, so polygyny is the ideal mating system. It is the best mating system for males, and it's the best mating system for females. Why don't we do it that way then? Why don't we do that? I mean, we obviously have examples of, of polyandrous systems. Right? That's what prostitutes are. And in some parts of this country, we have polygyny. And certainly in the Middle East, we have, and in, the, and in Asia, we have examples of polygyny. But why is it that we have essentially monogamy? Under what conditions do you get polygyny? Under what conditions do you get monogamy? Under what conditions do you get polygyny? Where do you see polygynous systems? In the Middle East is primarily, right? How does the Middle East differ historically from America? In terms of the distribution of resources, how is it different? Well, up until the last three years, right, uh, before Trump, how would you have classified 
American society. Egalitarian, okay, how many of you consider your family to be middle class? Raise your hand if you think your family is middle class. One, two, three, four, five, six, everybody in here thinks you're middle class, okay? Nobody thinks that they're in the lower classes. Nobody here is rich. If you're rich, you wouldn't be here probably. Okay? All right. So let's think about that. So nobody in here is rich. Everybody's in the middle class. What does it mean to be in the middle class? How much money do you have to have to be in the middle class? How much money do you have to make a year to be considered middle class? All right, how much money do you think you're going to make as soon as you get out of college? How many dollars per year? What do you, what do you expect to be making? Well, you're going to lowball it a little bit because you're a biologist. Or if you're not lowballing it, go find out about it when you graduate. You're a biologist, after all. How much money can you expect to make? What, what does the average teacher make? The average grade school or high school teacher, how much do they make a year on average? $37,000. Yeah, probably not thirty-seven. probably closer to $35,000. Okay. Uh, how much does, uh, does a policeman make? Would, would you consider a policeman to be middle class? Sure. How much does a policeman in Cape Girardeau make? How many dollars per hour? They're not salaried. They get paid by the hour. How much do they make? It's been a while since I've looked. The last time I looked, it was eight dollars and seventy-five cents an hour. Okay. If you make ten dollars an hour. Right? and you work 40 hours a week, that's $400 a week, right? So $400 a week times 52, that's $20,800 a year. So let's imagine if you're a cop, you make 20 grand, 20K. Is that middle class? It's not middle class. Okay? So what what's middle class? How much do you have to make to be middle class? A little fifty thousand. Fifty thousand? I think you need fifty K. So most university professors would not be middle class. How much, uh, how much does the SEMO football coach make? Last year, uh, he got a $70,000 pay raise because they won some games. So the Board of Regents gave him a $70,000 pay raise. So I think he's, I think he's up to 320k for the football coach. I think he makes more than Vargas. I think Vargas makes 270. You can look it up in the Missouri Blue Book. Okay. So yeah, that'd be middle class, upper middle class. Okay. How much does Bill Gates make? How much is Bill Gates worth? How much is Jeff Bezos worth? He just got a divorce. Right? Me and his wife split split the pot. And after after they split the pot, she was the richest woman in the world or something like that. So she was worth fifty billion. So he, he walked away with fifty billion, she walked away with fifty billion. Fifty billion dollars? 
I mean, that's, if you're, if you're worth $50 billion, okay, and you invest that money, okay, and you make 10% on your money, which is relatively easy to do, right, if you're smart about investing, that means he's making $5 billion a year just off his investments. That means, you know, he's got to spend about a half a billion dollars a month just to spend off all that extra money. Could you spend a half billion dollars? That's $500 million a month. Could you spend $500 million a month? That's like more, that's $125 million a week. Could you spend $125 million a week? I don't think you could. I couldn't. Okay? So most of us have this unrealistic idea about what the middle class is. Most of us think that we're middle class, but we're not. Okay? The system is highly divided right now. It used to be that the system looked something like this, right? There were the super rich, there were the poor, and then there's everybody in the middle. So you say, that's the middle class, those are the rich people, those are the poor people. That's not what it looks like anymore. Now the system looks like this. There are all these rich people like that, and then there are all these poor people like that. The system is divided. And the, and the bizarre thing about it is, is that now you have a president who's over here, and the people that he appeals to are over here. So this rich guy over here gets all the support from these poor people down here. That's clever. This guy is good. He knows how to manipulate, okay? He's got these people down here thinking that he has their best interests at heart. Isn't that odd? I think it's amazing. It's, it's incredibly interesting. Okay. So now you have this divided system. There is an unequal di distribution of resources. Here's why that matters. Monogamy works best when there's roughly an equal distribution of resources. When you have a system that looks like this, this is when you get polygyny over here and polyandry over here. Monogamy is in the middle. So the whole concept of monogamy is this sort of egalitarian idea, right, that got developed in this country at a period when we had relatively even distribution of resources and an even distribution of opportunity. But over the last couple of decades, things have changed rather dramatically. And now we have this extreme unequal distribution of resources, and we're mimicking what you find in the Middle East. In the Middle East, you've always had this. The royalty and the rich people over here, the oil tycoons, right? And then the peasants, the peons, the public, they're over here. What's the sex ratio of humans? How many babies are born are male? How many are female? What percentage? 51% female. No, actually it's like 50.1% male and about 49.9% female. It's roughly 50-50. Okay? That means if you have one guy that's got five wives, that means there are four guys out there with none. Okay? Because there are equal numbers of males and females. Every time one guy has multiple wives, that means there are other guys out there that have none. Okay? That's one of the reasons why we like monogamy, because in monogamy, every guy gets a partner, potentially, 
right? And you have a nice, stable, even, smooth running society. But as soon as you begin to disrupt it, which is what we're in the midst of doing, and you shift over to the system where you have polygyny, you're also going to end up with polyandry. And it's at that point where you start to get unrest and revolution and all of that kind of nasty stuff. Okay? All right. Well, let's look at what some other animals do. Just for about 10 minutes here. Let's think about what some other animals do. Um, let's think about Saromelos. Saromelos obeses. Sorrow means what? Read the Lord of the Rings. Who's the bad guy? Sauron, right? So sorrow refers to lizard, okay? What does obesus refer to? If somebody is obese, what are they? Overweight. Overweight. Okay, they're fat. So, Sauromalus obesus, the fat lizard, okay? And what Sauromalus obesus is, it's a lizard, uh, they get to be about this big, okay? And the reason they're called fat is not because they're fat, but because one of the ways they protect themselves against predators is they're on these rock piles and they climb in between the rocks and they blow their bodies, they puff their bodies up with air. So they inflate their bodies, and they look really flat, fat, and they're wedged inside the rock, so you can't pull them out, okay? So they protect themselves against the foxes by wedging themselves into the rocks, and, and the foxes can't pull them out, okay? Now, the cool thing about Saramelis is they live on these rock piles. So when you're out in the Mojave Desert, if you find a pile of rocks or, you know, a tailless slope or anything like that, you go looking around it, and that's where you'll find these guys. They're always on rock piles. And what these guys do is they, 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 they go out to feed in the desert. They're feeding on, on creosote and mesquite and things of that sort. And then they come back and they sun themselves on those rock piles. Now there, there is going to be one male, and he's referred to as the tyrant. And that tyrant, he gets 95% of all the females. So 95% of all the females are going to mate with the tyrant. Okay? 5% of the females will mate with another male. But 95% of all the copulations that take place are with the tyrant male. How does the female choose him? How do they know that he's the tyrant? They know he's the tyrant because he's the one with the biggest, fattest tail. And what these guys do is they store energy in the tail. So whereas we store energy over our belt, or on our butt, or in our thighs or something, these guys store energy in their tail. And they use that energy to get them through the winter. So the tyrant that has the biggest, fattest tail is the one who gets all the babe lizards. Okay? So little babe lizards are running around and they see this, this big male with a big fat tail and they get all dewy-eyed and you know the little motors start running and they say, yeah, he's the, he's the one that I want to mate with. Okay, and he's the one that they'll choose. Until the big bad fox comes along, and they all scurry into the rocks. And the fox can't get the lizard out, but he can reach in and grab the tail. And one thing that many iguanid lizards do is they have this thing called tail autotomy. 
So they will sacrifice the tail to give up their to save their own lives. So the little guy, he once the once the fox starts pulling on the tail, he contracts some muscles, the tail pops off, and the fox gets the tail. So now this lizard doesn't have his tail anymore. It's okay, he'll regenerate it, it'll grow back, but he no longer has the biggest, fattest tail. And suddenly he's gone from tyrant to non-tyrant. And now there's going to be another male that has the tail that's going to go in there and get all the females. Okay? So there's a nice example of a polygynous mating system in nature. Um, you could, there's, there are these scissor tail flycatchers in um, Costa Rica and in uh, Central America, and it's kind of cool what they do. Uh, there will be a male, um, and he's referred to as the alpha male, and he will find a partner, another male, referred to as the beta male. And they'll pair up, and they're going to learn a duet. They're going to fly around the jungle singing this duet to any female that will listen. And they'll find a female, and they're going to listen. The female listens to the duet, and she'll ignore them. These two males are going to continue to practice their little duet, and sooner or later, they're going to get the duet just exactly right, and they're going to sing it to a female, and she's going to be interested. She gets excited, and she's going to mate with the alpha male. And as soon as she's mated with the alpha male, that duo splits up. And this male now goes off and finds a new beta male. And he's going to do the same thing all over again, teaching the duet once again to this new beta male. And this beta male says, oh, now I know what the duet is. So he goes off and he becomes the alpha male, a new alpha male, and then he's going to go off and find another beta male, and he's going to teach the duet to this beta male, and they're going to go off and try and find a female to mate with. The female is selecting the male that has exactly the right song. Okay? It's important. The female is paying a lot of attention to the song. Why? What does the song indicate about the male? Why are male cardinals brightly colored and female cardinals drab? What do the bright colors indicate? They're healthy. They're healthy. They know where all the good food is. In order to have the bright colors, you have to have a good diet. Just like flamingos. You see flamingos in the zoo? They're all this pale pink. You see flamingos in nature? They're brilliant pink. That's because in nature, they have the right diet. In the zoo, they don't get all the nutrients they need. OK? So what the female is doing is she's choosing the male that has the intellectual capacity to be able to handle the song, and that's probably also the male that knows how to get the food, how to protect itself, and all of that sort of stuff. Okay? So males are paying. Males in, in birds are usually the ones that are advertising with bright colors or songs or something like that. Females are generally drab, and that's because it's female choice. Just as in humans, it's female choice. Okay? So in humans, it's female choice. Why? Because reproduction is expensive for the female. In birds, it's female choice. Why? Because reproduction is expensive for the female. In lizards, it's female choice. Why? Because reproduction is expensive for the female. In turtles, it's female choice. Why? Because reproduction is expensive for the female. Is there any species where it's male choice? No. It's always female choice. Why? 
because reproduction is expensive for the female. So we now know who you should reproduce with. The next question becomes, let me just take a couple of minutes here, um, how often should you reproduce? So we want to know, we've, we've talked about with whom to reproduce, how often to reproduce, and we also want to know when to reproduce. Let's start just very briefly and then we'll come back next week and finish this up. If we want to talk about when to reproduce, should we do it early? Or late? In other words, should you delay reproduction or should you start reproducing right now? Okay? Well, let's think about that. How many of the women in this class have babies at home? Nobody. What's wrong with you women? You not? Why, why don't you have babies? What are you doing? You're delaying reproduction. Okay? Why are you delaying reproduction? Well, I just haven't found the right guy yet, or, well, you know, what really, why have you not started to have babies yet? Give me one reason. You don't know? Why don't you have a baby? She doesn't have the resources to support one. She doesn't have the resources yet, okay? And she'd like to get a career started. And she knows that if she waits, she'll be a better mom. Okay? So that's one strategy. She's delaying the onset of reproduction so that she'll have more resources so that her offspring have a higher probability of success. Okay? She knows that her life, her reproductive success, and her life are going to be better if she delays reproduction for a while. Okay? Contrast that with a 16-year-old girl in high school had to drop out of high school because she was pregnant. Okay? What does life look like for the 16-year-old that gets pregnant? It's not great. Well, she's probably condemned herself to a life of poverty. Okay? Uh, because probably the guy that she was sleeping with was probably also a high school kid or something and he's got no job. And now because he's going to be a dad, he's probably dropping out of high school and getting a job, minimum wage job, and so on. So they're condemned to a life of a single wide that's used in a trailer park on the south side of Scott City or something. Okay? So they're not, it's not going to be a life of comfort and leisure. It's going to be a, which means they're not going to have the resources to devote to their offspring. Okay? So their offspring, their kids, are unlikely to go to college. Their kids are sort of going to be in that low-income thing as well. So whether to reproduce early or late is going to be a function of availability of resources, right, and what the possible future looks like. Um, I think we'll stop right there. What, when we come back, we're going to look at this. We're going to look at mice. We're going to look at pinion mice, um, and we're going to look at kangaroo rats, which are the perfect um, dichotomy there uh, for these different reproductive strategies on reprodu reproducing early or late. All right, Wednesday we'll meet here uh, once again, and then uh, I anticipate that we'll be outside. Okay. So please dress appropriately. It's obviously if it's raining really hard or something like that, we won't go outside, but um, plan on it at any rate. Okay, see you guys next time. <laughs>